Good afternoon, all of you students out there in streamable learning land. My name is Stephen Schabel, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Center for Birds of Prey and the Avian Conservation Center, just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Have a really exciting program for you this afternoon, talking about one of my favorite uh, groups of birds, the kites. Now, a couple of things before we get going too far. First of all, as we're going through the program today, if you have questions, put them in the chat window down there. And Elliot, who's behind the camera here, he can let me know when you have questions and, and uh, we can address those. I also wanna give you just a little bit of background information on the center here and on what we do uh, before we get too much into the kites. The Center for Birds of Prey is a nonprofit organization. Again, we're located just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And for the last 28 years or so, we've been doing uh, a number of things related to number of things related to birds. We have a medical facility here on our campus where we provide care for birds that are injured in the wild. Lots of bad things happen out there uh, to birds, most of them driven by human activities. They get hit by cars, they get tangled in things, they get shot, uh, they eat things they're not supposed to eat, and all of those reflect on, on our activities. So we decided uh, to try to take care of some of those birds and fix the problems whenever we could. You may have seen our program earlier in the year right there in our avian medical facility. We also have an educational program where we work to help people understand these birds a little bit better and, and understand perhaps what we can do to uh, protect them better as we move forward. So again, today we're going to be talking primarily about a group of birds of prey that a lot of folks aren't all that familiar with called the kites. Now this bird that I have with me here is a Mississippi kite, which is one of the two native kites found here in South Carolina and one of uh, four kites that we have here in North America. Now, uh, just like most of the birds that we work with, the kites are raptors. So a couple of features that will tell us that we're looking at a raptor when, when we are doing so. First of all, the word raptor means to grasp and carry away. So these kites like hawks and eagles and owls and falcons have feet that are built for grabbing things. We'll talk a little more about what they grab uh, a little later on. So very sharp talons at the end of those claws um, for grabbing their prey and holding onto it. Um, a couple of other features that we see the raptors also have beaks that are curved to tear their food into small pieces. And you can see that curved beak on this Mississippi kite. And finally, like most predatory animals, the kites have a large range of binocular eyesight. So eyes on the front of their head that allow them to have depth perception, which for them is very important. And again, when we get to the prey of the kite, um, you'll realize just how important that is. Looks like we have a question already. That's Are great. So um, great question. And, and it may be the sun and maybe we try to rotate a little bit. Um, he's actually gray. So um, slate gray on the chest and a, a little bit darker. So, Elliot is too far. so uh, slate gray on the chest and a little bit darker gray with some iridescence on the back. Now that is the color palette that we would expect to find in an adult Mississippi kite. So um, actually, all Mississippi kites look different than this at some point in, uh, in their development. This is the, the plumage, the appearance of one that is two years or older. So um, I think maybe we'll, we'll rewind just a hair and go back and talk about kites and what that means and, and so on. So we've got a couple slides on, on a PowerPoint here that we'll talk about really quickly uh, just to give us some... Uh, some, so we can start there. Right, this is what pops into most of your heads, I guess, when uh, when you hear the name kite, that toy that um, that we're all familiar with that just hangs there in the wind. Now the toy, believe it or not, actually took its name from the bird. So we can move to the next slide. And, and the bird there, this is one called a swallow-tailed kite. We're gonna come back uh, to them as we move forward through the program today. But the bird got its name from a type of flight called kiting. So. Um, I do have two slides here that go into some very elementary physics, which uh, I always get a little nervous when, when physics is the uh, discussion. But um, kiting is a type of flight that allows you to stay in the air without having to do really any work on your own. And it's all based on a shape in the wing called the cambered airfoil. So if you just looked at these two shapes, you will notice that the one on the bottom has a flat line on the underside of the wing. So a straighter, shorter distance between the front end of the wing and the back end of the wing. Whereas the top um, shape, the symmetrical airfoil, both the top and the bottom line are the same distance. What the cambered airfoil shape allows is for air to move faster under the wing. And faster moving air generates 
uh, less air pressure or actually more air pressure, which generates lift, which pushes the wing up. And so how do we get this air moving over the wings? Well, it's all about wind for the kite. And if wind blows over that bottom shape, it generates a net upward force. So high pressure on the bottom, low pressure on the top equals lift. And uh, if you've studied anything about flight ever in your, in your discussions, you know that one of the things you have to do to fly is you have to counteract gravity, that force that pulls us down towards the earth. And the force that birds use to do that is lift. So by having this wing shape and a very light body and positioning themselves into the wind, the kites can essentially just hang there in the air without having to flap at all. So we can come back to our Mississippi kite now here for just a moment, I believe. I'm not sure what our next slide is, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. So I wanna talk about diet for just a second and uh, what these birds eat. So just for some perspective, this little Mississippi kite weighs about 250 grams, which is right around half a pound. Um, he is mostly wing, and that's one of the features we expect to see in the kites is a very long wingspan, uh, which allows them to be very efficient. We have another question. Did something happen for this guy for him to be here? So yes, did something happen for this guy for him to be here? Um, one of the things that we see that happens quite frequently um, and it relates to the breeding season of kites, is that they end up falling out of their nests. So kites, uh, the Mississippi kite is one of what we call a neotropical migrant. We're gonna come back to migration in a few minutes and see that challenge. But uh, suffice it to say for right now that these birds nest here in North America in the late spring and the early summer. Here in South Carolina, Mississippi kites are beginning to incubate their eggs now, um, maybe in the last two weeks. Uh, their chicks will begin to hatch in the middle of June, and those chicks will continue to grow. Now, they, the Mississippi kites, they nest at the top of pine trees. And one of the things that happens here, especially in the South, especially in the summer, are thunderstorms, which sort of the peak thunderstorm season for these, um, for uh, South Carolina is right around the peak breeding season for Mississippi kites. And this little guy, like many of his counterparts, um, got blown out of his nest as a hatchling. And um, that can provide quite a challenge. Obviously, it can be deadly to a bird if they end up falling all the way out of the tree. Uh, but it also provides a challenge in terms of a, a bird that ends up uh, without parents to take care of them. And someone, some well-meaning person, picked this bird up after he had fallen out of a tree. He was only a few days old. And they took him home and they fed him. And that's where things really went wrong. Um, he's what we call a human imprint. So he associates all the things that he should associate with kites with people. And as we'll see in a, in a few minutes, it's important that they are able to associate with one another. So let's go back to diet for a second. Half a pound in body mass. And the general rule of thumb with predators and prey is that their prey is going to be smaller than they are. So if you start running through that list of things smaller than a pound and a half, there are a lot of them. Uh, but these birds are very specific. And uh, in most cases, their diet consists almost entirely of insects. So this is an insectivore. Um, and and a raptor, which is kind of a rare, a rare bird, if you will, in that insects can be kind of, uh, can be challenging in a number of ways. It's hard enough to catch an insect, but imagine having to catch them in your feet. So uh, that's a challenge that really requires uh, a lot of maneuverability. So most of the kites, um, as we saw in that swallow-tailed kite image, have very long tails. And we can see the tail on this Mississippi kite. It's very long for the body size. And that long tail is what allows him to be as maneuverable as he needs to be to capture his insect prey. Most kites also have a tail that's forked in the middle. And we'll see that, and we're going to see a kite in flight in just a few minutes. So forked in the middle and long is the tail shape that's best for high maneuverability. So there's challenge number one. If I'm going to eat insects like dragonflies and I'm going to catch them in my feet, I'm going to need to be maneuverable. We already said that kites need to be efficient, which is very important as well. And kites need to feed without stopping. And we're going to see that um, in, in just a few minutes again when we get a kite in flight. These raptors actually eat while they're flying, which most raptors don't do. Most of them sit still to feed. We have another question. Are kites a type of owl? owl? So are kites a type of owl? No, kites and owls are similar in that they are both raptors. So they both catch their food with their feet. Um, but they are very different. Uh, in most other ways. First of all, most owls are nocturnal and all of the kites are diurnal, daytime active hunters. Um, you may notice around his eyes, he does have some sort of flatter plates of feathers there, which kind of look a little owl-like, I guess, depending on which angle you look at. Um, he's got similarities to the owls, but he is dramatically different. So 
eating on the go, being very light and efficient, and being highly maneuverable, those are three things that we're going to need to deal with if we are a kite. But what about uh, in the seasons when there aren't insects available? So our native kites, the Mississippi kite and the swallow-tailed kite, I mentioned they live here in North America in the spring and the summer when there's plenty of dragonflies to eat, when they can make a nest and hatch chicks. But what happens in the fall and winter when all of the insects disappear? Many of you may not be aware of this, but most dragonflies are either migratory or they go through some dormant cycle during the winter uh, where they're not available as food. So what does a bird do when the food that he eats isn't available where he is currently living? Well, you have two options. You could either start eating something else or you could move. And the kites are migratory. So um, before we take this question, I want to go to a slide here and I want to talk about migration really quickly just to put it all into perspective. I think in the PowerPoint we've got here we go. So this image shows us uh, a picture, uh, a gra graphical depiction of some swallowtailed kites on migration. This is a bird that nests right here in South Carolina. So if we were to look at the picture, you'll see seven or eight different colored lines. Each of those colors represent a different bird and their journey between where they spend their summers and where they spend their winters. Um, the top of the map there at the top of the globe, that would be the, uh, the area here in the southeastern United States. Uh, the bottom of the map there where they are migrating to, that would be southern Brazil and um, other parts of South America. That is a journey that in some cases takes these birds 5,000 miles just in one direction. That's a journey that takes them over oceans, the Gulf of Mexico between Florida and Cuba, uh, also over mountain ranges, the Andes Mountains. Um, and as you can see on the next slide, I included a, a second migration map. Sometimes they take strange overwater routes. So that white colored bird in this image went all the way from Cuba across to Central America, across the entire width of the Gulf of Mexico. Kind of an odd choice. Um, may have been driven by weather patterns. Obviously wind and such um, can affect which way you want to move. And um, it could also be a storm track that took them in that direction. So migration is a huge deal for these birds. All of the kites that live in, in South Carolina, all of the Mississippi kites and all of the swallowtail kites spend half of their year with us and half of their year 5,000 miles away. That means that if they're going to make it through their annual cycle, they have to fly at least 10,000 miles. That to me is one of the most amazing things out there. Okay, so we're gonna pause. We had a question and we can come back to the, to the us view for a minute. How long do they live? How long do they live? So that's a really good question. And if we uh, go ahead and talk about, uh, add in what we just talked about with migration, uh, how long do you think most of them live if part of their annual cycle is a 10,000 mile journey over oceans and mountains? Right? Birds uh, are pretty fragile animals, even though they are remarkably resilient, they make amazing things happen, but um, they have to do really hard things in their life. So the truth is that on average, most birds don't live very long, especially those that are migrating. Um, potentially they can live a very long time. This bird is four years old this year, I believe. And the kite we're about to see in just a moment uh, is 12 or 13 years old. But you'd have to be really lucky if you were a wild kite out there making a living doing that. So one more thing to talk about before we get our uh, kite out here in flight. And that relates to the fact that when kites migrate, so if we were to uh, think about the annual cycle and this little half a pound bird that's making a living eating dragonflies and grasshoppers, he would have made his first migration in the wild when he was only about two months old. So again, here in South Carolina, kites hatch in June. And by the middle of August, the chicks that just hatched in June, if they're going to be successful, have to be on their way to South America, taking that journey over the oceans, over the mountains, 5,000 miles. So that in itself is a huge challenge to grow as fast as they do. And if you um, have ever experienced our, our Young Birds program, we, we talk a lot about growth and, and I'd encourage you to watch that again next year um, when we do that, that's usually in the early spring, but a kite has to grow so fast to be ready to go. How on earth are mom and dad going to afford to feed them? So there are records of Mississippi kites, adults like this one, staying in the air all day. So from 10 in the morning till five in the afternoon, just to catch enough dragonflies to feed themselves. So it takes all day just to take care of yourself. How on earth do you feed those young? Well, what happens is that during the breeding season, 
they broaden their prey to include things that are larger than insects, things like snakes and lizards that they glean right from the treetop. So one of the um, one of the most amazing sights, I think, is a little Mississippi kite flying through the air, carrying uh, an, an, an old lizard or a green tree snake uh, and eating it as they fly while they're carrying it back to the nest to feed to their young. We've got another question. How good is their eyesight? How good is their eyesight? So this bird makes a living eating dragonflies, which are relatively small, that he catches in his feet. So, uh, and high, high speed, right? The uh, dragonflies are quick. So do you need good eyesight to capture a moving target that is both tiny and highly maneuverable? Absolutely. So first of all, if we talked about eyes, their eyes are giant in relation to their body size. His eye, uh, if you had an eye on the same scale as his, you would have uh, an orange or at the very least a tangerine for an eyeball. That's a big eye. Um, the next amazing thing about birds' eyes is how densely packed they are with photoreceptor cells. So the rods and cones that we have in our eyes, he's got those too. He just has a lot more of them than we do, maybe 10 times as many in his eyes. So very, uh, very detailed vision. And there's good evidence to show that most birds, including kites, probably have the ability to see even more color than we see. So ultraviolet light probably plays a role in what these birds are out there processing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this guy back in the box and we're going to get a kite out here in flight and see some of these things in action. So I mentioned they catch moving targets in their feet and they eat while they're flying. So we're going to see that. I also mentioned that when they are hatching chicks in the nest, they grab food right out of the tops of trees. I'm going to do a demonstration of how that works for you as well. Uh, and then to wrap it up, we'll talk about one of our native kites, the swallow-tailed kite and what's going on with them. So I'm going to put this guy up for a second. All right, Elliot, if you want to capture the uh, emergence from the box, we can do that. Assuming he wants to emerge from the box, it's a pretty hot day. We have a question there, yeah. Speaking of hot, do they sweat? <laughs> so yeah, it is a hot day today and sweating for a bird is not something that they do. Uh, they uh, do need to keep their bodies cool. And so they can do that in a couple of ways. They pant, so when they get hot, they open their mouths and they pant. Uh, they can take a bath. That would be another great way to stay cool. Now the bird we're going to see here is called a yellow-billed kite. He's a native of Africa. And I mentioned that we're going to talk about uh, all of those things, catching food on the go, eating on the go, all of that. Uh, but first let's talk about his body shape. You can see that he has a very long wing for his body size. This guy's larger than the Mississippi kite, but uh, still only weighs about a pound and a half. His tail is very prominent. He has a very long tail. It's triangular, it's forked in the middle. Again, that's the shape that's best for maneuverability. So what I'm gonna be doing to demonstrate his hunting, I'm going to toss a little piece of food into the air. It's just a little bit of beef for the demonstration today. And we're gonna watch what happens. We know that he is a raptor, that he catches that food in his feet. So I'm gonna give him the cue and he's gonna come in. And Elliot, I'm gonna to try to put this about five or six feet above my head for when he catches it. Did we see what happened there? Happened fast. He caught that food in his feet. And then what he did next is where it really gets amazing. He brought that food up to his mouth and he ate it while he was flying. We'll do this over and over again. Catch it and eat it. Catch it and eat it until you've caught enough dragonflies that uh, you have filled up for the day. Now, not every dragonfly is really easy to catch. So I'm going to make some of these a little harder. I'm going to come out further away from them. We'll put that maneuverability to the test. You can see that he turns his tail just a little bit in order to change direction. Sometimes he can even flip upside down. Let's see if we can do that. All so that he can catch 
those insects over and over again. Now I mentioned how much harder it gets for them during the breeding season when they have to feed their young. So uh, if I need enough food for a growing uh, young bird, I need something larger than a dragonfly. So I want you to imagine that this little piece of food I'll put on my fingertip is a snake on the branches of the trees. And we'll see what the kite does. Got something on his mind up in these trees. I'm not sure what it is, but. He's looping over here. All right, here he comes. There he goes. He's acting very oddly, and I'm not sure why. I don't know. I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to see if I can get him to come down to me. I think he has a feather on his face <laughs> that he's seeing in his eye. And I think that that is making him nervous. We will check and see if that is the case. It's a good point to talk about training and how we train these birds. We use positive reinforcement to train them. We reward them when they do what we want them to do. One of the hardest parts is getting this guy to stop if he doesn't want to. Well, I see the feather on your face. He does have a feather on his face. Whether that's what's causing him to behave like he's behaving or not, I don't know. So let's shift gears and we'll come back to him in just a minute. He's gonna go sit in that tree over there and we'll talk about the swallowtailed kite and then we'll come back to this guy at the end. So the swallowtailed kite is a bird, we saw an image of it a little bit earlier. It's a bird here in South Carolina that is considered an endangered species. And what that means is that there aren't very many of them left. So the image that we're looking at there, that's, um, let's see, I'm gonna shift over here. So this image shows what was the historical range of the swallowtailed kite on the left, and what is the current range of the swallowtailed kite on the right. Now you'll notice that the current range is significantly smaller than the historical range. 200 years ago, the swallowtailed kite was found nesting in 22 states here in the United States. And today they're only found in seven of those 22. So uh, even my math can calculate that that's less than a third of their historical breeding habitat. We destroyed where swallowtail kites make their nests. They only nest in what we call bottomland hardwood forest. It's also known as swamp. Uh, and if we look back at humans and how we've responded and behaved about swamps over time, uh, we destroyed a lot of them. They're scary places, right? Filled with fog and, and snakes and who, know, who knows what's in the swamp. Our easiest answer and what we did in most cases was we destroyed those swamps. And that again caused a dramatic range decline. Now, the swallowtail kite, I think we have another image of it perhaps after this, yes, is a very recognizable bird. And so one strategy that we take in working to protect the swallowtail kite is by asking those in the community to tell us when they see them. So you can see this picture of the bird here, very recognizable, like the kites that we've seen, long tails that are triangular and forked in the middle. Um, this bird, however, has a white on black color pattern that is very recognizable, easy to see. And what we ask is that you report your sightings to us. You can do that best on our website, the Center for Birds of Prey .org. Then we can use those sightings. And I think the next slide shows us an annual, uh, this was in 2016, I think, or 2015, of all the sightings that we saw. Uh, we can use that information to build a better picture of where the kites spend their time. Again, most of their breeding is currently seen in the coastal zone of the southeastern United States with patches around those areas where we expect to see a lot of swampland. Obviously, this kind of information can help us to work to protect the habitats that are so important for these birds as well as others. 
Okay, I think we had a question that um, someone was waiting yeah, to ask. Thing question. Yep. So, how strong is their grip? How fast do they fly? What is their wingspan and how many species of kites? So, there's a lot of great questions all wrapped up into one. So, if we go back to uh, to their lifestyle, if you will, if we talk about uh, what they eat, do you have to be fast to catch dragonflies? Absolutely. Now, we did a program not too long ago talking about falcons, and the falcons are the, the really breakneck speed birds of prey. The peregrine falcon can dive at speeds over 240 miles an hour. Now, kites are not that fast. I often describe kites flight as quick rather than fast, right? They are not 240 mile an hour, but they are very quick to respond to the movements of their prey. Their grip is strong enough to kill an insect, um, it would be strong enough to puncture my skin if I didn't have a glove on, right? So we always wear these gloves. Uh, but less the strength of the grip and more the precision of the grip is kind of the, the, the deal with kites. Just take that small piece of food uh, and move on with it. Um, how many species of kites are there? That's a number that I don't have off the tip of my head. Again, there's four in the United States, the Mississippi kite, the swallow-tailed kite, the snail kite and the black-shouldered kite, which is in California, I want to say there's in the neighborhood of 30 species of kites found in the world. Uh, there was another part of that question that I missed, wasn't there? I got size, wingspan, long wings for the body size, and broad wings. I'm going to see if I can get our kite back in flight again. He's had long enough to sit in the tree. I may have to go over to him, but... One of the challenges of training animals is that we can ask them to do things. It doesn't always mean that they're going to do them. I'm asking him to do something right now by putting my hand up in the air. That's his cue for come over here and catch this piece of food. But he is choosing not to do that. So I may have to walk closer to him to get his attention. That's what I'm going to do. Could just be that it's really hot. That's why he doesn't want to come out of the tree. Could be Elliot with the camera. I don't know. This feather. That's on his cheek. I'm going to see if maybe I can get him just to me. Take this feather off of him. And then we can go from there. There he is. And did you get the feather off yourself? You did. No. So again, this is called a yellow-billed kite. He's the second largest species of kite in the world, native to sub-Saharan Africa. So he ought to be plenty good at dealing with this heat. Elliot says, let's get back in the shade. I'm with him. And this is a bird that was bred to be trained uh, for demonstrations. He actually has never been to Africa. He hatched here in South Carolina and he spent his entire life here with us. Um, yeah, I think maybe he is a little nervous about you today, Elliot. I'm not sure what you did, but. Uh, <laughs> um, you can see a couple of things happening here. Again, uh, first of all, his body is very specific. That long triangular forked tail, that's a kite. Relatively small feet, good for palming those dragonflies. And how about that mouth open? Somebody asked earlier about do they sweat? Now birds cool off through evaporative cooling like we do, uh, but more like a dog. He's got his mouth open and he's panting and that water is moving, uh, off, evaporating off of his tongue to uh, help him cool down. Some of you might be wondering about this ringing sound when he moves. This is a bell that's attached to him and it goes along with an antenna that you might see that's attached to his back. This is a radio transmitter that would allow us to find him if we couldn't see him again. He's a bird that 
And sometimes when he's flying, he takes a little detour and we have to go and look for him. Looks like we have some more questions. How fast do they grow? How fast do they grow? So remember that Mississippi kite chick um, that's hatching in the middle of June. When they hatch, they weigh in the neighborhood of 30 grams, maybe a little bit less. So that would fit in the palm of your hand. By the time they are eight weeks old, that's two months, uh, they are full grown. That's 250 grams, full size, full wingspan. So um, less than eight weeks to go from hatching to as big as they're ever going to be, which again is, is pretty well a bird thing. Birds grow fast. If you're lucky enough to have nests in your yard, you're watching these young birds growing up remarkably fast. We have another question. Can they dive fast like a falcon? So dive fast like a falcon. Anybody that uses gravity efficiently can go pretty fast, right? If you go up and let gravity work on you, you come down. His shape is not as streamlined as a falcon. The peregrine falcon, you would see a much more condensed body, a much uh, t more tapered wing, much less broad wing. Uh, these broad wings on the kite, they are great for efficiency, but they're kind of clunky in terms of speed. And then this really long tail um, would also get in the way of the extremes of the speed. So something like 80 or 90 miles an hour wouldn't be out of the question for them, but not 240 miles an hour like a falcon. Do they have tongues? Do they have tongues? Absolutely. Bird's tongues are some of my favorite things. I don't know if we're going to be able to get in and see this guy's tongue, but I'll, uh, I'll use a piece of food to kind of help. Elliot's zooming in on his mouth as best he can there. The kite says, I don't know. That camera is a scary thing. Um, his tongue has a bone in it. It's called the hyoid bone, and that bone helps pull food back into his mouth. He actually also breathes through a hole in his tongue called the glottis. So um, birds do have tongues, and they are really, really interesting. We could do a whole program just on bird tongues. Maybe one of these days we will. All right, so I want to take just a moment here and um, say thank you so much for watching about kites with us today. Again, uh, some points to remember. If you live in the southern United States, you may see Mississippi kites and swallowtailed kites, but not all year long because they're migratory. They're only here during the warm weather months. Uh, and if you do happen to see a swallowtailed kite, uh, one thing you can do to help that species in terms of its numbers in the wild and working to protect its critical habitat is report that sighting to us. Go to the Center for Birds of Prey.org and you can let us know when you saw them and where you saw them and what they were doing and that can help us to protect their habitat. We have another question it looks like. Yep. So fluffy or slick, how about both? Right? Birds in general are covered in a sleek outer coating. Right? What you can see here, these brown feathers, that's his um, what we call contour feathering. He doesn't like me touching them very much, right? Under those contour feathers, you would see a much fluffier coat of what we call down feathers. You can see them sticking out here, right? I just, I just disrupted his contour feathers and now his down is sticking out. And those are the feathers that insulate his body. So sleek on the outside, fluffy on the inside, a little bit like me. <laughs> All right. Thank you folks again. Thanks for joining us on Streamable Learning today. We'll see you again next time. Have a great summer.